Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm just going to give everyone just a couple minutes to get logged in. I always like to start out by just letting you know so that you know if you are actually in the right place and if this training is for you. So go ahead and type yes in the chat if this sounds like you. So if you've never really had a good system for language therapy and you know that you're supposed to feel like an expert when you get all those referrals, but you don't always feel like one. And maybe sometimes you feel like a fraud because you're not exactly sure what you're supposed to be doing. So if that sounds familiar, go ahead and type yes in the chat. And then also, if you're tired of wondering what an SLP is supposed to be doing for literacy-based is issues, and maybe you're kind of embarrassed because you think it's something that you should know by now, or if you have students who you feel could make some legit progress, if you just taught them the right skills, but you aren't really sure where to start and you just don't have a good process and you know, hey, these students could be successful in school and in life. They could go on to leave successful adult lives if I just give them the right start now, but you're not quite sure what to do. So you're also in the right place if you've experienced all of those things and you want to change that. You want to make a change and instead go to work confident, feeling like the expert that you thought you would be and that you wanted to be when you decided to become an SLP. I mean, we all really wanted to change the world when we decided to go into this profession to begin with. But I know a lot of us have found when we've actually got out in, into the workplace that, you know, sometimes we hit some roadblocks. Go ahead and type yes if any of that sounds like you. Back when I started in 2004, I felt the exact same way that I just described to you. I did not feel like I knew what I was doing when it came to language. It was the class I hated the most in grad school. It was the worst grade I got in grad school and it never made sense to me. And I was like, I just wanna go medical. I don't wanna deal with any of this stuff. The Arctic stuff is fine, but with language, I have no idea what I'm doing. And, and I didn't even really like it because it didn't make sense to me. It just seemed so huge and nebulous. And I wanted to quit. I, I wanted to just get out of the schools. After my first half of a year, I started in the middle of the school year and I worked until the end of the school year, wanted to just go into the hospital or something like that. But you know, instead, just because of personal, a personal situation, I stayed at the same job and after a while, just really got curious. And I ended up going back for my doctorate in special ed and really made language my area of specialty. And, and I found that I felt completely different once I had a system and once I felt confident. And I want to share that that process and that system that I use with you tonight. But what I was able to do, and the, the most important thing here is that I went from feeling like this. So it was like I had all of these language skills that I wanted to address with my students. I knew they had all these things that they were struggling with. And I was literally just grabbing random crap off my shelves, trying to figure out what I should be doing with them. And so my system for language therapy looked about as organized as this office does right now with stuff just everywhere. And I would just be pulling random things. And yeah, I was doing some things right, but I didn't have a process and I was jumping around so much that my students weren't getting better. So what I found was I was writing a lot of goal updates like this, where it was like not making progress, 40% accuracy. And then I'd be writing the goal again. And it was like, wow, I, I'm writing these IEP goals. Shouldn't they be meeting some of them? Or shouldn't I see some of my students maybe getting into the, the general education classroom more and being more independent? Or maybe sh shouldn't, I, shouldn't I be dismissing some of these kids? Isn't that the whole point of therapy is to work yourself out of the job? And I found when I changed my approach and when I learned to do what I'm going to share with you tonight, I went from doing goal updates like this to what I'm going to share with you in this quick case study here. So I wanted to share this one. And this is this is an example. And I've had other cases like this, but I think this one 
just really highlights the, the aha moment I had. So this student that I had was one of the first kids who I dismissed because he was better, not because he'd plateaued and we would, we basically said, you know, there hasn't been significant progress. I guess we'll just dismiss. And, and cause I had a lot of cases like that where when we got to a certain point, they were in junior high, it's like, well, okay, I guess we're done with speech. Even though they hadn't really gotten better, they just plateaued or maybe they'd, you know, they weren't really participating in therapy because they weren't very motivated. This was the, one of the first cases where I actually dismissed a kid because they had met their goals. So he started out in kindergarten with a speech and language IEP and his literacy scores on the, the district reading benchmarks. So the things that they do three times a year for all the kids to see who needs the extra interventions. He was in the 10th percentile and he was one of those kids where I thought, okay, he only has speech now, but um, we will be getting this student a full case study. And we will eventually be looking at other services for this student. And eventually, we're probably going to need more. And what happened was when I actually worked on the right skills with him, he actually, so I should, on the screen here, you can see that he started in kindergarten in the 10th percentile. By the time he was in third grade, his literacy scores had bumped up to the 45th percentile. So he was well in the average range. And when I started with him in kindergarten, his language scores were in the 70s. But when we worked on focused language skills, this is where his scores were in third grade. So you can see that he's got some in the low average and then he's got a handful of scores that are actually solidly in the average range. So it is possible for some students to actually boost those language skills and get out of special ed. And this student, I was able to send him on to fourth grade without any IEP, without any special accommodations or anything like that. Now I've had other kids that maybe they were in the special ed classroom all day and we just got them to the point that they were still getting services, but maybe they were in the general education classroom for most of their, their day and they just got pulled out for extra help. Obviously we can't dismiss everyone, but the, the point is, is that you can make drastic improvements to what you're doing instead of just writing the same goals over and over again. So the point is, is that I found that it was possible to actually actually make progress with, with these students. And it came because I was focusing on the right skills. And so I was writing more progress updates that looked a little more like this, where it was like, hey, he mastered the goal. And most importantly, I was able to do that without spending hours and hours planning. So this is a picture of me with my family. And the important thing is that I was able to get home to my family. I wasn't spending all night and weekend working because I had a very clear focus about what I was doing. So once I did that initial research to figure out a good system, planning became a lot easier. So the good news is that you can get results like this if you learn what I'm going to share with you tonight. But the bad news is that nothing will change if you don't invest in yourself and invest in the time to learn those things. And obviously, you've already taken the first step by being here tonight. One thing I wanted to share before I get into the goals of the presentation is my financial disclaimer. I own a company called Dr. Karen LLC and have a couple websites through which I earn income, one of those being drkarenspeech.com. The other one is not as related to speech pathology called dissertationsbydrkaren.com. But the important thing to note is that I do earn income from products that I sell on both of those websites. And that is why I am able to offer free presentations like this one. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the goals for today. Number one, our first goal is for you to learn the one thing that has a massive impact on academic performance, where you can make a huge difference as a speech language pathologist. Number two, for you to learn the five components under that umbrella, under that one thing, 
And number three, for you to eliminate some of those less important skills on your to-do list so you can get better results with less effort. The big question here is, is there really one skill that will determine whether a student will succeed or fail in school? And then not just in school, but life beyond school, because obviously school is supposed to prepare them for life. So when we think about that, I want to just ask you really quickly, obviously, we're all working with kids who have academic issues that have language processing issues. So just let me know, yes, in the chat, are you working on any of these things? Or do you have students who struggle with any of these things? So just general comprehension. So you read something to them or they read something and they're not able to tell you what they just read. Or getting the big picture, stating the main idea answering inferencing questions, or just summarizing, retelling information. So yes, obviously, you know, people are saying, yes, these are things that we work on all the time. These are things that we need to do in school in order to succeed. And we obviously would need to do them if we were in any type of work setting beyond school. So very important skills. So obviously, if you have identified these things as areas of concern in your students, you are on the right track. But and, and what a lot of us end up doing, it's what I end up doing, and this is, this is right some of the time, but what a lot of us end up doing is working on these things directly, partially because we want our therapy to be relevant to the curriculum. And this looks a lot like what kids have to do in school and in their classroom. And we want to work on those skills and make our therapy helpful for that student. And, for them to be able to generalize that. We want it and we it's the the term that we often use is contextualized therapy or curriculum based therapy. So yes, these skills are important, but here's the problem with if you're only working on these things or if you've got this massive laundry list of things and these are just some of those things on there. And that is that if we're going to make a lasting impact on language, not only can we not jump around, but we need to treat the cause, not just the symptoms. And a lot of times those type of issues are really a symptom of a deeper underlying cause when it comes to a student with a language disorder. And so if we're trying to work on those things and then we're trying to work on grammar and syntax and vocabulary and WH questions and whatever else that's coming up, we're working on a lot of things and we end up spreading ourselves very thin and burning ourselves out and burning our students out. And so when we get scattered like that, it's really hard to make progress in any one area. And so, as I like to say, not just treat the cause, not the symptom, but also don't half-ass two or more things, whole-ass one thing. So instead of trying to work on all of this, focus and, and find that key area that makes a true impact and really hone in on that because that's when we can make that lasting impact, when we focus and when we narrow it down. So let's talk about what that is and how that works and why it works. So first, we wanna find the skills that make that big, biggest impact. So we find, think of it like dominoes. We, we really wanna find that first domino. So obviously you've got a lot of skills that you need to work on. That's all your dominoes. And what you wanna do is find that first domino and knock it down. And what that does is it meet, makes the other things irrelevant or much easier to knock down. So think of those comprehension things as the other dominoes. So if we address some of those underlying language skills, sometimes those comprehension issues can clear up. Or when we get to working on comprehension, they're a lot easier to address and our students are ready to respond to those treatments. And it makes it much easier for our students to to actually improve those skills if we address some of those other underlying language issues first. And what we've found is that when it comes to reading comprehension specifically, when we're trying to figure out what that domino is, is that when we think about what we actually need to comprehend, we're not able to comprehend text 
if we don't know at least 90 to 95 percent of the words in the text. So I think about my craniofacial class that I took in grad school that was the really hard class that everybody freaked out about. I didn't know a lot of those terms in there, so I'd end up reading it over and over and not understanding what I read. But if I read a novel and I knew all of the the words and I knew the context, then it was a lot easier to understand. So, so that's really what happens a lot of times when we have those comprehension breakdowns. And another thing that we don't always realize, or maybe that we sometimes skim over because we just have so many things that we're working on, is that not only do we need to know the words, but if the reader, and this quote is taken from an article by it's, I believe, Cheryl Scott, and it's called A Case for the Sentence in Reading Comprehension. Um, the email that I'm sending you with your CMH certificate and your testing time saver will also have a reference list. So you can check this article out. Um, you should be able to log into the ASHA website and find it. Um, but she said, if a reader cannot derive meaning from individual sentences that make up a text, then that's going to be a major obstacle in text level comprehension. So basically, if you can't understand the word and the sentence, you're not going to understand the whole paragraph. And a lot of times we jump ahead to the whole paragraph because that's what students are being asked to do in the classroom. But we're really just skimming over those basic skills that they don't have. Now, it's OK for teachers to do that because they've got a specific curriculum that they're following and a lot of typically developing students that don't have language problems can learn those skills implicitly. And and so that's OK for the classroom to be doing that. We just need to know that for our students, that's not always enough. And so what happens if we don't address sentence level comprehension in kids with conditions like developmental language disorder, speech and language impairment. And again, I use those terms synonymously because I know we're, we have some changes in the terminology that we're using. We're going towards developmental language delay instead of specific language impairment. But know that this applies for those conditions and other disabilities that impact language growth as well. So what happens is that we don't address those things then they don't get better and kids might be able to, they might not be able to really make progress with some of those harder comprehension level skills that we teach kids like stating the main idea. So I wanted to talk about this specific study because it really hones in on some of those skills that do affect reading comprehension. And I think that it really helps focus where the SLP should fit into all of this, because I think that that's where a lot of us really get stuck is that we don't know where we fit in to the mix here. So according to a longitudinal study by Marilyn Nippold, she looked at kids from from early elementary school all the way through high school. So she did this massive longitudinal study, and these were the skills that popped out as impacting reading comprehension scores. So topic knowledge, broad knowledge of the topic, lexical knowledge, so that would be like specific word knowledge, word decoding abilities, so being able to read quickly, um, and then syntactic abilities, being able to understand the syntax and the sentences and how sentences are structured. So really, you need these things intact. And, and that's really what impacts your your ability to comprehend because there's an issue of cognitive load here if you can't read quickly and you don't recognize words right away you're thinking about that and not the overall message of the of the the text that you're reading so what she found was that kids who had problems with reading comprehension in elementary school still had problems in high school when those deficits in vocabulary and syntax were not, not resolved. So if we just worked on reading comprehension and didn't work on those underlying skills, those things didn't get better. And the key takeaway is that the problem if we're skipping to those high level comprehension skills for kids with language disorders that really need that explicit instruction is that those kids without disabilities in the classroom might be picking up on those things implicitly. Yes, teachers work on things like grammar, but not to the extent that our students on our caseload need. 
And they need more direct, explicit attention to those skills, more so than teachers are able to give in the standard classrooms. And that is really essentially where we fit into all of this. So we want to ask ourselves, as a result of these findings, what are those missing pieces? And then where are we best qualified to help? Because a lot of times just the roles in literacy in the schools, it's kind of like big oops, sorry, bumping my microphone here. There's, it's like puzzle pieces fitting together where, where all those things are important. What the teacher's doing is important. What we're doing is important, but it's all got to fit together. And we have different roles in this process. So the one thing that's really popping out here is obviously vocabulary and word knowledge. So if you don't understand those words and that, that topic knowledge, it's really hard to understand what you're reading. Obviously, vocabulary has to do with language. So really, you are one of the best equipped people to make a huge difference in your students' lives and to really be that one person that can come in and really help them. So really, vocabulary is that first domino. This is where you can get that biggest bang for your buck based on an area that has a massive impact on literacy and overall academic skills. So if we look at students in second grade and look at their vocabulary skills, studies have actually shown that those students who have the strong vocabulary skills in second grade are the ones that are gonna be reading well and just doing well overall in high school. Unless, and for those kids who are struggling, they have a significantly higher risk of being the kids that are struggling in high school unless we come in and intervene. So really what we want to remember here is that the general education tends to not be enough for them when it comes to those comprehension things and they need more intensive intervention that they won't get from anyone else besides you because you are the language expert. You are the one that's trained in diagnosis and in therapy and in just being able to scaffold and give that explicit intervention. And chances are, even if you don't feel like an expert, you're probably closer than you think to being able to really deliver this explicit intervention. So really, this is where we can be the hero. You can be that hero who changes everything for your students. So you can be the one that helps really turn those things around for them and be the person that gives them what they need when that general education curriculum is not enough. But obviously, just saying work on vocabulary is pretty general. And so I started to have this aha moment when I was preparing for for my, my doctoral research. And so I knew that vocabulary was the area I needed to address, but I continued to do research because I needed a system for actually doing that. And so that's what I wanna share with you now. And with just prefacing this by saying the first step in learning how, like specific tactics, strategies, materials, games to use, whatever, things like that, is really learning the what. So what are the big picture skills? So I've just explained why we're doing this. Now I'm going to move on to the what. So the important thing to know about vocabulary is, or actually, before I do that, let me just ask you guys a quick question and check in. I am going to, before I move on, I'm going to talk about the specific parts of vocabulary, but I want to check in with the chat. Again, I will answer questions at the end here, but I'm gonna pop in because I was talking and I saw some questions coming in. Okay, so it looks like it's mostly people, everybody introducing themselves. Again, thank you so much and, for being here. And it sounds like we're all on the same page with, with what we're working on, what we're struggling with here. And then I also see some comments here, um, just that sometimes it's really hard to tell that what to do when we have kids who come out low on those sentence comprehension tests. Like I see Ashley is in the chat here saying that it's hard to tell what to do when kids score low on that sentence comprehension subtest on the self. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a perfect example of how syntax plays into this. So, so yes, I, before I move on though, 
how many of you feel a little bit better now that we've at least narrowed our focus? I know I haven't told you everything, but do you, are you feeling a little bit better like, like, hey, I'm confirming what I'm doing or I, I at least know where I can focus and have that, that big picture? Okay, so I'm going to move on here. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about the what in those key areas of vocabulary here. So um, obviously another problem with skipping right to paragraph level comprehension is that we're kind of randomly exposing kids to a bunch of different words and structures. And we can't guarantee that they get enough exposure and practice with the right skills. Now I see a lot of people saying, Yes. And some people say, and if you're feeling kind of so-so about it, um, I, that's why I want to provide some additional clarification here about what I mean when I say targeting vocabulary. So we've identified it as that big picture skill, but we obviously know that vocabulary is more than just naming and identification of words. And this is where I got tripped up when I was first practicing. So obviously tests that measure vocabulary, you'll have to name a picture like what is this you know tell me what this is expressive vocabulary point to the picture that goes with what i say so so those are the things that we think of when we think of a vocabulary test but the the thing is is that vocabulary is more than just that and this is actually what it is so when we think about vocabulary it's actually a big umbrella term and this is where a lot of i think a lot of us get confused where I got confused personally and where a lot of vocabulary materials that you might get in catalogs and things like that kind of miss the mark or, or maybe they just only give you part of the story. So there's actually five components that fit in to vocabulary and they all interact with each other and they all interact with vocabulary and they impact our ability to, to learn and use words. And they are phonology, orthography, morphology, semantics, and syntax. So all five of those er language areas impact our ability to learn and apply words that we use. And when you think about that, this can really function as our system because if you address all of these things, this really covers your bases really well when it comes to what kids need to do need to do in those academic language situations where they're reading and writing and things like that. So let me go into each one of those areas to just clarify what I mean. So when I talk about phonology, obviously we know that we are, when we say this word, sometimes we mean a phonological disorder. So a speech sound issue. But it can also have to do with having a phonological representation of a word. So just being able to recognize a word when we hear it and make meaning of those sounds when we hear all of it. So when you hear that word, can you hear all those sounds put together to form that word and then make meaning from it? And then can you produce it? And so obviously sometimes there might be some articulation issues and a kid might still know a word. but there is also a piece to it that's cognitive linguistic where it's like they don't know the sounds and they don't know what that word is when it's put together. It's kind of like when you heard a word, but you don't really know it that well, so you can't quite say it. It's like on the tip of your tongue. And so that is really what we mean when we're talking about phonology. So part of it is really knowing how the sounds fit together. Then also we have orthography. So this comes into play, especially when we're reading and writing. Now, of course, it is possible to have a good vocabulary if you aren't a strong reader and writer, but it makes it significantly harder because part of knowing a word is knowing how it looks in print and being able to recognize it like that. That's called having a mental orthographic image. And it's really when we say sight words, really it's not rote memorization. It's just being able to see those symbols quickly and put meaning to them quickly and know what they mean. So that impacts your vocabulary knowledge as well, knowing how orthography and the way words are spelled impacts their meaning. A perfect example would be a word that like steak and steak, so steak that you put in the ground when you're camping to hold your tent down or steak the, the meat, those are spelled differently. Spelling can impact meaning. So, so orthography plays into vocabulary as well multiple different ways. And then the other area, the next area is morphology. 
So I know I see someone mentioning the prefixes and suffixes. Absolutely. So those word parts impact meanings of words. And this actually, again, I mentioned that all five of these areas overlap with each other. So when you're talking about morphology, you're also talking about orthography because the way that words are spelled and the way that those word parts are spelled impacts their meaning. And having knowledge of morphology can significantly help you to be able to spell the words right and to be able to infer meanings of those words and understand what words mean. And the interesting thing is that we've always thought about this as like, you know, don't address it till fourth or fifth grade or so. And, and yes, maybe kids aren't able to read and spell words that have multiple morphemes until fourth or fifth grade, but they can still use them in speech and they can still understand prefixes and suffixes way earlier on. And so we can actually start to work this into our therapy way earlier than we think. So I wanted to pause really quickly before I go on to semantics and syntax to just give you an example of how these things tie together. So in this situation, this is just one example of how these things really like th this, uh, um, of how phonology, orthography, and morphology fit together and how this can actually impact what the word means and how it's spelled. So with this word, I know a lot of times when kids are spelling words, we, we tell them sound it out. But when you are starting to get those words that are have multiple morphemes, we don't just want to think about phonology or and the sounds. We also want to think about morphology because look at this word. There's five phonemes. That might be hard to remember. But if you can remember that there's two morphemes in that word and know what they mean, know what re means and how to spell it, then that's one unit. So it would be a lot easier for you to remember those two units and know what they mean and know how to spell those rather than trying to sound it out. And you can see also that you could say, okay, if you know what take means, what does it mean to retake? Well, if you know what re means, you can infer that meaning. So you can see that they all play, they all fit in together. And Phonology fits in too, because if you look within those morphemes, it makes sense why those words are spelled the way that they are and why we pronounce them the way that they do. So, um, quick question here. I see a question, where do I get, and I'm not sure if this is for me, but for everybody, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it. So Ashley asks, where do you get your words to target in therapy? And she said, I've asked teachers for grade level appropriate vocabulary words that I can target um, so I can target what they're doing in the class to be out. That's perfect. That is the ideal way to do it. I sometimes I have a bunch of tier two word lists and those that's exactly how I got those words. A lot of those word lists out there, it's like they're so common that chances are, even if you don't take them directly from your students' teachers, the chances are they're going to be coming up. So if you used any tier two word list, that would probably be pretty good. But it's always ideal to be able to catch up with teachers to know what they're doing unit by unit. But if it's tier two, honestly, if you're not always perfectly synced up with the unit, that's probably OK, because those should be words that they need across a lot of different situations. <laughs> and actually says, I have two, but the teachers don't give them to me. That's that's difficult as well. I would say um, one thing um, that can be really helpful. I got some manuals from a special ed teacher who had some extra teacher manuals that the teachers all had. And I got my tier two words from there. And that way I didn't have to track all of the teachers down. I did have a lot of teachers who were pretty good about doing that. But I know that you know, sometimes you ask and they get busy or you have to, you know, hound them and hunt them down. So I would see if you could get a hold of some of the materials and that that could be really helpful. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next so we can keep going. And um, so I can keep this moving along. I wanted to, to let you know with morphological awareness, I get a lot of questions about how do we know, you know, this seems like it would be too hard for some of our kids. Kids are able to use affix knowledge to infer meanings of words as early as first grade. So even if your kids can't do this perfectly, even if they can't spell the words perfectly or read them perfectly, you can still be working this into your therapy as early as first grade. As soon as your kids are starting to read, you can be working that element in and at least pointing it out to your kids. Okay.
Um, now I wanted to move on to semantics. So obviously we're pretty good at semantics. This is really what we think of when we are thinking of vocabulary. This is what the, the part of vocabulary that has to do with meaning and semantic features. So those pieces of information that are associated with that word that help us understand its meaning. And what I like to do here is go through what I mean when I say semantic features, because if you go through and study these things with your students and really point them out and talk about all these different pieces of information, that can really help with those students that have issues with word retrieval. And so what I'm going to do now is a quick little little interactive activity here. I am going to go through semantic features for nouns, verbs, and adjectives. And I'm going to give you a word, and I'm going to describe the semantic features of it and see if you can guess what that word is. So let's start with nouns. So some of the semantic features that you can describe for nouns include things like category, function, physical attributes, composition, parts, associations, and location. Obviously, you know, with a kid with a language issue, sometimes if you ask them, tell me everything you know about this, they'll give you like one thing or they'll give you like five of the same piece of information. Like they'll tell you a bunch of functions, but not any other pieces of information. So when we're when we study semantic features, it helps helps with that storage because we're drawing kids attention to those other pieces of information. So take a look at this, see if you can guess what word I am describing. So um, it's a kind of animal or a canine. It barks and can hunt. You can walk it and train it. It can be brown, black, gray, or white. Um, it can be small, like 20 pounds, or it can be even bigger, like 80 pounds or even more. It's made of muscles and bones. It has warm blood. It has four legs, a tail, floppy ears, sharp teeth. It has... Uh, you can use a leash, a food bowl, or chew toys and collar, and you can find it in a dog house or a kennel. And yes, it's a dog. And yes, this is very similar to the, the expanding expression tool. That is also a tool that helps you do semantic feature analysis with a mnemonic device. This is slightly different because I call physical attributes. Um, I include things besides what you what it looks like. Um, and I break apart the parts. So I also include associations in there. But the general thing here is that it's always good to start with category because it helps your students to learn good definitions. So you can see that this is these are all the pieces of information and it was very clear what I was talking about. And, you know, this is a lot of information that I was able to come up with because I was organized and I was able to use those pieces of information to think of things. So I wanted to do verbs and adjectives because I think a lot of us know how to do this for nouns, but obviously a lot of those words that they have to, our kids have to study are verbs and adjectives as well. So semantic features for verbs that you can do are synonyms, antonyms, context of action, purpose and method, and associated nouns. So obviously we know what synonyms and antonyms are. Those are really important pieces of information that help us define verbs. So one way that we would define a verb would obviously be the state of synonym. The context of action would be the context in which you would do that action. So like, when would you do it? The purpose or method would be more of the why or the how you would do something. And then associated nouns would be any things associated with that action. So let's see if you can guess what word I'm talking about here. Um, for synonyms, you um, let me see here. So this means the same thing as jogging or sprinting. It's the opposite of walking, standing or just strolling leisurely. It, you might do it when you're racing or competing, or you might also do it when you're in danger. The reason you would do it is to get somewhere quickly. And how you would do it is you're propelling yourself forward one step at a time. And some things you might use would be athletic shoes, a track, and a stadium. So people are saying running. So you're correct. So you can see that I was very descriptive here. And I gave you a lot of pieces of information. Now I am going to see if I can stump you with the last example here with adjectives. So with adjectives, what you can do is things like synonyms, antonyms, associated nouns, and associated verbs. So synonyms and antonyms, we talked about that. Associated nouns would again be 
things that are associated with whatever that descriptor is. And then verbs would be things that might make you feel that way or any actions that might have to do with that descriptor. So I, always, I tend to stun people on this one, but let's see if you can at least get in the ballpark. Now, if you're doing this, you don't always have to do the guessing game like I'm doing right now. But if you are with a word like this, where there's a lot of possibilities, obviously having some multiple choices might be a good idea. So let's see what we come up with. So it means the same as happy and ecstatic. It's the opposite of being sad and depressed. And it is, we might feel this way when we're around friends, family, or when we have make an amazing accomplishment or when we have an unexpected pleasant surprise and some actions that might go with this feeling would be achieving something, enjoying, being thrilled or excited, doing an exciting or enjoyable activity. So people are saying things like proud, grateful, joyful, excited. So again, all words that would be totally appropriate. Um, the word is elated. So you can see there that you can do this. Yay, Katie said a lady, elated. I'm not sure if you said that as I was saying it um, or if you got it. Yep. Okay. So good job if you said elated. Carissa, I see you said it as well. So, so good job and, and thank you for participating in that. But the important thing here is that we want to draw attention to all of these different things. So now you can see an example of how we might do that. So that's semantics. I want to move on to syntax. Now, I think we, we, we know why semantics is important, but I think a lot of us, including myself, when I started out, um, I didn't realize how important syntax was and how it tied in to vocabulary. So obviously one of the things that we want to have kids do is show us that they can use words and no one will be able to use the word if they can't say it in a sentence and no one will be able to use the vocabulary we teach them in sentences if they don't have a good sense of sentence structure. So there are certain types of sentences that are really important. If you have my sentence structure guide that I sent out to you before this webinar, you know some of them. But the one that really stands out is just really being, like I say, is the, the comprehension killer because it's linked to deficits in both comprehension and language expression is complex sentences. So this is the one that is just really, really hard for kids with language disorders because it relies so much on just processing those little connecting words and function words and not just the content words. And you can't rely on word order when you're comprehending or when you're trying to understand a complex sentence. So that's why syntax is so important. So if you left this presentation just working on one thing in syntax, if it was complex sentences, you would be making a significant a significant improvement and you'd be really helping your students if this is just, if you just picked one type of sentence to work on. So this is why complex sentences are so difficult. If we look at this sentence here, we've got two clauses. So this is a complex sentence because we have an independent clause right here that can stand alone as a complete sentence. And then we have a subordinate clause that is not a complete sentence unless it's attached to this independent clause here. So subordinate clause and independent clause are the same thing. We've also got a subordinate conjunction here that's helping us connect those ideas together and showing us how these two parts of the sentence are related because it's telling us the order of when they happened. So the important thing here is that when we have temporal conjunctions like this, we, we need to remember that last clause, but we also need to remember what happened first. And then we need to remember that word after and remember what it means. And then we have to remember what after means. And then we have to remember which came first and which came second. So that's a lot of information to process at once. It's really hard for our kids with language disorders. And you can kind of see here, if we don't know what the words mean or we don't know the purpose of the words, it's really hard to understand the sentence. So... So that those are really those key pieces here. And when we go back to that research that Nipple did, we can actually tie those things that popped out as correlating with reading comprehension to a lot to those, these skills, these essential five skills. So topic knowledge and lexical knowledge obviously are tied 
heavily into syntax, word decoding abilities, obviously phonology, morphology, and orthography all fit into that. And syntax, obviously there's a direct correlation there. Now this isn't the only way they fit together because those five areas all impact each other, but this is just an easy way to help simplify it and understand how those things can all impact reading. So back to that first domino, essentially how we knock it down is by diving into these five areas with our students. So what I mean by getting meta is being direct. So you're talking directly about these rules because they might not pick up on them if you don't do it that way, if you don't explain them directly. And again, those five areas where we want to get meta with our students, we want to teach them explicitly in, with the understanding that these will all impact comprehension or when we get to that work on high level comprehension and narratives and things like that, that that will be significantly easier to address. So those five areas were phonology, orthography, morphology, semantics, and syntax. So what really happens when we learn to knock those big dominoes down? Well, number one, we get to write progress reports that look like this. So instead of writing not making progress and feeling like nothing we're doing is working and we're not making any difference in our students' lives, we get to actually write some progress reports that say, hey, this goal is mastered and we finally start to see our students make breakthroughs, which is really why we wanted to be SLPs in the first place. So instead of seeing students just get pushed along and never making any measurable gains, we finally start to see them getting to their restrict least restrictive environment, possibly getting out of special education, and finally enjoying learning. And then the thing is, when that happens, some other things happen too. And namely, that when we start to get really good at our jobs, we make ourselves indispensable. So we don't have to go in and feel like our current job is our only option and worry that if we were to go into some other situation or maybe take private clients on the side, that we're not qualified. When we are confident in our jobs, that confidence comes across and that's when we become a valued member of the team and people actually value what we do. And this can do amazing things for your career, not just in your current job, but in any other job that you go to outside of this one. What I've shared with you today is number one, I've shared with you that one thing that has a massive impact on academic performance, which a lot of us, we get so overwhelmed with all of the different steps and possibilities and all the different things our students can't do. And we forget to focus on that one important thing. We've also talked about the five components under that umbrella of that just one thing. And then finally, we've talked about how we can eliminate some of those less important skills on your to-do list so you can get better results with less effort. So let me ask you this before we move on and go any further. Do you think that you could learn how to knock down that big domino and learn this system if someone took the time to walk you through it? Go ahead and type yes in the chat if that's the case. All right, so let me peek over here. It looks like I see some yeses. So people saying, yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So if that's how you feel, and if that is the case, then I have good news for you. So this is exactly what I will help you do in Language Therapy Advance. What that is, is an online program for SLPs. So it's an online course. And what I do in this program is I walk you through the exact system I just shared with you. And I walk you through step by step and show you exactly how to do it. So I show you how to build all those, all those building blocks that fall under vocabulary. I walk you through them one piece at a time and give you specific step by step protocols that you can do in your therapy so that you can complete that entire system and implement it seamlessly. 
And I show you how to do this so that you can ultimately build the language skills your student, students need to succeed in school and in life outside of school so that you can leave a lasting impression on your students' lives forever and really make an impact on the next generation of adults. So let me tell you a little bit about what's involved and how this works. So in Language Therapy Advance, what this is, is an online training program. And in each of the core online trainings, you'll learn how to implement each piece of the system that I've walked you through today. So we walk you through all of those essential five, and I show you exactly how to integrate them into your therapy to really nail your role and build those academic language skills that your students need to succeed in school. Now, there is a total of eight hours worth of training in these self-led online learning modules. And the way it works is that you can log into the members portal and watch them whenever you want. And you have lifetime access to these trainings. What you'll learn is the following. So in the first module, I show you how to get more done in less time in your language therapy. So we walk through the scope and sequence of the entire system and why it helps you get results without completely burning yourself out. We'll talk about why your students are so be far behind and why you as the SLP are the best equipped person to help. And then you'll learn the secret sauce that helps you make powerful breakthroughs with your students. And then in the second module, we'll get into the specifics of the systems, starting with semantics. So learning semantic skills that generalize and learning how to get those students to remember what you teach them in therapy and apply it to other situations. So I'll show you how to build semantic knowledge so that it sticks without tons of materials and unnecessary planning, how to get your kids excited about learning words, even the trickiest cases who are totally bored with speech. And I'll show you strategies that help your students keep learning words even after they learn, leave your therapy room. In the third module, we'll dive even deeper and I'll show you how to build definition syntax. So this is specifically how to get your students to explain and define words. Even if they have really poor word retrieval skills, I show you how to work through it and improve those skills. So I will walk you through how to get your students to understand how to define a word, even if they've always struggled, how to help your students become meta aware of word definitions so they can easily explain and define words instead of having to just memorize flashcards, because we all know that that doesn't work very well for students with language disorders and it's really boring and your kids don't wanna do it. So I will show you how to make it interesting and make it stick. And then I'll also show you how to help your students remember definitions without any of that boring drill and repetition. Then in module four, we'll dive deeper into syntax and we'll talk about why working on syntax is mandatory and why it's one of the most powerful things that you can do to boost reading comprehension and language comprehension. I'll walk you through how to build syntax skills and improve comprehension, including step-by-step -step strategies for doing this, even if you only see your students once a week. And then I'll also show you how to move from doing that more structured work to more functional comprehension tasks, even if you're only doing push in therapy. So you'll know how to bridge from pulling kids out of the classroom and possibly working in to getting into the classroom or figuring out how to make your therapy effective, even if you're not able to get into the classroom. And then in module five, we'll walk through building spelling, decoding and language skills through word study. So, so I'll walk you through why kids with language disorders are struggling with traditional spelling instruction and what you should do instead to help them, why you as the SLP are highly qualified to work on spelling and how you can seamlessly work this into therapy sessions and how to build solid grammar and spelling skills by studying phonology, orthography, and morphology. So bottom line, this is the only place that will help you build an evidence-based system for language therapy, instead of having to pull all kinds of things together on your own and having to spend hours planning and piecing it together on your own like I had to do. I wanna give you a shortcut so you don't have to do that. And I wanna help you do this so that you can go to work confident you're giving your students exactly what they need to someday be successful adults and to be successful students now. 
And it took me years to figure this out, but I want to give you a massive shortcut because I want to help you be a highly effective and confident at delivering your language therapy and becoming indispensable this year, not having to take 10 years to do it. So let me tell you a little bit more about what comes with the program. Now, of course, people always ask me, all right, you're going to show me what to do. Are you actually going to give me the tools to do it? Well, yes, absolutely. I will also, for any of the strategies that I am showing you how to do, I will include the materials that you can print out so that you can use them in therapy right away without having to go gather a whole bunch of things and keep track of a whole bunch of materials. And these are absolutely no fluff, nothing extra that you don't need, just exactly what you need to do in order to get the results that you want. In addition to the materials library and the core course modules, you'll also get exclusive access to the private members Facebook group. Now, the great thing about this is I know how frustrating it is to go to a conference and then have no way to ask follow up questions when you get stuck implementing all of the different strategies and how frustrating it is to try to email the speaker and getting no response. So I don't want that to happen to you. I want to give you the support that you need so I can be there with you to support you through this process. So for all of the members of the program, you get access to this Facebook group where you can ask questions for me and for any other members so that we are guiding you through this entire process if you get stuck. So some questions that always come up here is, is this a fit for me? Will this work for me? So I wanted to just walk you through a couple examples of other people who have used this process and gotten results so that you can tell if this is right for you. So number one, I have had students who have used this process with high school students. So my student, Connie, had a high school student who was absolutely stuck. He was so sick of coming to speech and she was honestly getting bored and bottom line she was spending more time planning than she actually was in therapy so she had a 30 minute session she'd spend an hour planning for it and it was getting ridiculous and absolutely running her life but what she found was that when she started to use this system to study words with her student her high school student who had been bored with speech was actually starting to bring words from books he was reading independently to come and study in speech. And what was even better is that she cut her planning time down by about 75%. So she's no longer spending double the time from therapy that she, to planning. She was able to cut it down and get better results in the process. So I have had other students who have also used it was this system with elementary age students. So my student Michaela found that she was able to get great results and start to see progress in students who had really been stuck with reading comprehension with those traditional reading comprehension strategies. And they were finally able to make progress when she started working on the foundation with them. But the true tangible results that were really meaningful to her is that she finally found her true passion and was excited to go to work. So now that she has a better understanding of language therapy and she's confident in what she's doing, she goes to work with energy instead of dreading Monday morning. And then finally, I have also had students get great results with middle school age students. So with my student, Elizabeth, she had some great aha moments with one of her middle school students who was kind of stuck, had a lot of things that were going on. He had some fluency goals, articulation goals, and she found that he actually started remembering things from one session to the next. So she had a session where she taught him something a week before and he said, hey, I remember that's what we did last time because we know how frustrating it is when students have no idea what we just taught them within the session and they don't remember anything and they don't generalize anything. But she finally started to see some of the, some of those results with students who were struggling with written language and reading comprehension. So. This program is for you if, number one, you aren't expecting results overnight and you're willing to do some hard work up front to save time in the long run. Bottom line, you do have to commit to watching the course, but I promise you it will be well worth it in the long run 
because not only can you use those for your CMHs, for ASHA, but you have that knowledge for life and you have access to these video trainings for life, meaning that you can log in and watch them as many times as you want. And once you get through it and you develop mastery of these skills and these strategies, that will have an impact on the entire rest of your career. This is also for you if you have speech and language only students who don't qualify for any other services and you can't stand watching them continue to fail. So if you literally feel like you've tried everything and nothing has worked, and if you finally want to feel like an expert so you can earn the respect that you deserve instead of people just wondering what the heck you do in your speech room, this program is also for you if your passion is working with school age students, K through 12, and you want to do everything in your power to turn this age group into successful adults. It's also for you if you want to specialize in helping students with grammar, word retrieval, reading and writing, so that you can finally feel like an expert instead of a jack of all trades. Maybe you have some goals that you want to achieve beyond your current position. Maybe you want to start seeing private clients on the side and you want to feel more specialized. Maybe you just want to have your options open and know that you can go into another job confident that you have the skills to be successful. Maybe you want to supervise. Maybe you want to go on and get your doctorate. So if you're sick of feeling like, like you don't have anything to offer this, as far as language disorders, then this is absolutely for you. And then finally, if you're working with a lot of students who struggle with academic language, so they're really just having a hard time cracking that academic code. This is, however, not for you if you just want a quick fix and you just want to print off some activities and go and you're not really interested in putting in some time to really rework the system that you're using. So again, I, I, I do give you printables in the materials library for everything that I teach you in those modules, but I don't do half-assery. I will teach you the best system possible. So if I gave you that quick fix, I just would be doing you a disservice because you're better than that. If you only work with very young children and you don't have a passion for K-12 education. So again, really little kids, um, you know, zero to three, even early preschool. So this, this system is more about the kids who are working on reading and writing. So if you only have preschool and younger, not as appropriate for you. If you have kindergarten on up, then it is absolutely a good fit. Again, if you're looking for craftivities and artsy stuff, I, I have a no BS, no fluff approach. I only give you exactly what you need, not to take away from any of that, you know, fun extra stuff that you might do to decorate your room or anything like that. I think it's great, but that's just not what I do. And then finally, if you only work with children with limited verbal abilities who use AAC or kids in life skills programs, again, this is more for kids who are on an academic track, who are in the general education classroom, or you are thinking that they have the capability to be in the general education classroom for that core academic instruction rather than being down more of a functional life skills track, or for kids who are primarily working with AAC devices. So now that we've talked about all of the challenges that you might be facing as a speech pathologist working with language disorders and talked about what's possible if you're able to finally learn a system, I want to ask you, what would it be worth to you to finally earn the respect of your colleagues and have people seeking you out? And what would it be worth to you if you knew exactly what to do when you got a language referral? or if you could gain a skill set that no one could take away from you, regardless of your materials budget, or if you had to switch jobs. I can tell you up to this point, I've spent over 10 years putting this together. I've spent over $60,000 in tuition, conference costs, materials, and manuals that didn't work. But I don't want you to have to do the same thing. I want you to have a massive shortcut and to be able to do that this year. So, of course, it costs me a ton of money. It costs me over 60 grand to learn all of this and put all of this together plus 10 years. But of course, I am not going to charge you that amount to get all of this. This program can be yours for an investment of just $497. 
So before we go on, let me ask you this. What is the cost of you staying put and doing nothing and continuing to do exactly what you've been doing all of these years? So you could continue to do the same things over and over again. You could continue to go to other professional development activities and incur the costs of the training of gas, hotel and food and plane tickets and materials. So you could get this information elsewhere, but it would be a lot more expensive and you would have to take time away from your family and therapy to travel. You would have little to no follow up support. So you'd have the confusion of not knowing and you'd have to continue to piece this together on your own. And there would be no way to watch the presentations. So if you're confused, there would be no way to access any support. But instead, I can give you the complete system that you need in order to do highly effective language therapy for the rest of your career. And because I am so confident that you will get results, I will even let you try the program for 60 days risk-free. And if you aren't satisfied, you get your money back. So if you make the decision to invest today, you can go through the entire program and implement the the entire system in your therapy plan. And as long as you have shown that you've put in the work up front and implemented the system and you still aren't happy, then I will give you your money back. So I know at this point that there are three groups of people who are watching this webinar right now. There are three groups of people who have signed up. The first group of people will watch this and will leave and do nothing. And as a result, nothing will change in their situations. They will continue to go to work and not get the respect that they deserve. They'll continue to hate getting up and going to work Monday morning. And they'll continue having their language therapy look like this, like a big jumbled mess. They'll be wasting time and energy doing things that don't work. And they'll continue to write progress reports that look like this they'll see their con- their students continue to fail. The second group will take some of this advice. So they might see some small wins, but bottom line, they're at risk for falling back into old habits because they won't have that support. They won't have the entire process. So they might get part of the way there, but they won't get the entire system in, and they won't maximize the results and get achieve their full potential and help their students achieve their full potential. And then there is a third group. That third group will fully commit to learning this and they will want to move forward and invest in what I've described today and it will change the course of their career. I have students in my program who are in that third group already who are seeing amazing results for their students and who are waking up every morning excited to go to work. I can help you be in that third group, but the choice is up to you. So you have a choice now. You can get results like this and become a true language expert and finally be able to get the respect that you deserve, or you can be in the group that does nothing. So you can let this opportunity pass. Or you can take the first step today and gain a skill set that will change your students' lives and earn the respect that you deserve. And bottom line, make you indispensable. So for the next 48 hours, I normally do not keep spots open in this course because I like to make sure that I can give students the best support possible. So spots are not open all the time. They're only open during certain times of the year, and then I close enrollment down. But since you have invested the time up until this point and shown that you are committed enough to watch this entire presentation, I am going to open a special spot for you in the program for the next 48 hours. So when you join to review, you get those core training modules that lead you through the entire language therapy system. You get the bonus materials library, and then you get to be a member of that private members Facebook group, which is priceless. So the the investment for the course is only $497, which will pay off in dividends over the course of your career. All you need to do to join and become a member is click the button below this video. That'll take you to a page with all the information that you need, 
All you need to do is click to that page and it'll take you to the sign up page where you can sign up and become a member today. So this will be available to you for the next 48 hours and then your spot will be closed and you will have to wait until the next time that I open enrollment, which I will be honest with you, depending on the demand, I am not sure when that will be. So if you're sitting on the fence wondering if this is right for you, there is literally no risk for you to give it a try today. So I wanted to take just a couple minutes while we've got that button available just to answer a couple questions that often come up. First question that we get, what age group is this appropriate for? So I addressed this somewhat already, but I get this question a lot. So I wanted to clarify, this is appropriate for students who are doing reading and writing. So that tends to be students in K-12. One question that we sometimes get is, is this appropriate for group therapy, one-on-one -on -one therapy? Yes, it is appropriate for both of those things. It is also appropriate for teletherapy or in-person therapy because you're getting online printables that you can use electronically or you can print out and use in person. Another question that we get is how does the lifetime access work? Well, what that means, lifetime access means that you can have access to the training modules as long as the course exists. So if you don't finish in eight weeks, you can continue to work through the course. Or if you finish the course in a couple months and you want to go back and rewatch the trainings, you can do that on your own time. Because again, you have lifetime access to all of these trainings, which means you can rewatch them as many times as you want and go at your own pace because you are logging in to an online training portal where you can watch the videos on your own time. Next question is, is this for CEUs? So how this works is that because I am not an ASHA sponsored organization, this is CMH is not CEU. So that's called Certification Maintenance Hours. So what that means is that you can still count it for ASHA for your licensing requirements. As far as your continuing education, you just have to track it on your own with a certificate that I will give you. So what that means is when you take this course, you will get eight certification maintenance hours once you finish watching all of the video modules in the course. So of course, because states can vary, you are responsible for knowing what your state requires as far as continuing education. Okay, so those are the big questions that often come up. Again, your spot is open for the next 48 hours. So as long as that timer is ticking down, that is the time limit that you have to make a decision as far as whether you join the course. So bottom line, that deadline stops in the next 48 hours. So you can be in one of three groups. You can be in the group that does nothing, you can be in the group that gets some results, but really pretty much stays in the same place. Or you can be in the group that makes a massive transformation and changes your students' lives and changes the course of your career. So the choice is up to you. So all you've got to do to become a member is click the button below and go to that sign up page and it'll take you to the link where you can enroll today. So thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the members area.